for the last we've been in space. Most of the human have not been tur doing tourism. They've been on board the International Space Station, doing experiments to advance material science, biology, and understand better how humans could live in space. Yet, they're actually only 400 kilometers above our heads. That's where the station is. And no one has been really further away since the Apollo era, almost 50 years ago. The good news is that's about to change, because in the next 10 years, we'll be back to the moon. The US are going, of course, but this time also China, Europe, Russia, Korea, Japan, India, all want to go to the moon. But the international dimension is not the only change compared to the Apollo era. This time, we're not going just to leave a footprint behind and grabbing some rocks. This time, we are going to the moon to stay. So the first question you may ask is, why? What's so interesting about the moon that would be worth going after? Do we really have to stay there? I'm going to give you three reasons why we are going to the moon and why it's important we try to stay there. The first reason is science. As the Earth and moon travel around the sun, and as the sun travels through our Milky Way, our galaxy is a Milky Way, and as the Milky Way travels through our universe, there is so much we don't know, starting actually by ourselves, life on Earth. And to solve these questions, we need to explore. Of course, the exploration starts by the exploration of our own planet, the Earth. But although the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, there is actually little history we can, we can recall, simply because the environmental, environmental cycle have erased most of its history. So if only we had a pristine neighboring body about the same age as the Earth that would have recorded all these events, and we do, sad the moon. You have to see the moon like a museum of our solar system. Whatever happened in our solar system a million, a billion years ago has left a trace at the lunar surface. Every rock or asteroid which crossed the solar system and landed on the moon two billion years ago is still there with critical information that must be retrieved. But we won't find all the solutions of the universe on the moon. We need to go further into space. And as we go further into space, we'll be also further away from the Earth, further away from its resources, its supplies. So we need to learn how we can be more independent from the Earth as we explore our solar system. And that's the second reason we go to the moon, because on the moon we can already learn how we can explore without relying on Earth resources anymore. So what it is like to be on the moon and trying to live up for a bit there? Well, let me tell you, it's not human-friendly at all. If you face the sun, it's 180 de 150 degrees. If you step in the shadow, it's already minus 180 degrees. You have no atmosphere, no air to breathe, and you have no magnetosphere to protect you against radiation, radiation coming from the sun, from space, so you're constantly bombarded. So how to live in these conditions? Well, just like on Earth, you will start by building habitat. Except that this one might be a bit different from what you are used to. It probably looks like a hair bubble with monitored air quality and temperature. And against radiation, the biggest threat at the moon, there is no magic trick. You, you build a sick wall. So maybe here we are, 10, 15 years from now, with a research station at the lunar surface. We can analyze samples directly at the surface. We can have a view of the solar system without any environmental or light pollution. So we can really have the, the, our best telescope at the lunar surface. We today have all the technology to do that. The Earth is just seven days away. Sending human and equipment has never been so cheap and reliable. But if we do it that way, we don't learn anything, right? Because the second you want to go to Mars, and all your model just falls apart. So we need to start thinking differently. How would we do if the Earth was not actually that close? but that close, just a dot in the sky. Because then you cannot, you cannot um, rely on Earth supplies anymore. If you break something, you are probably in trouble. 
So it's time to think differently, not to think about how you can use the resources of Earth, because the Earth is just too far. You are in space, it's time to think about using the resources of space. So let's go back to the moon and have a look at what are the resources of the moon that we can use to sustain our research station. I told you earlier that to protect yourself against radiation, you just need to build a thick wall. That's pretty basic technology, right? That's not something you really have to ship on a rocket. How can you, find, how can you build this wall on the moon? Well, if there is something you won't miss on the moon, it's dust. You have five to 10 meters thick dust all over the surface. You just need to find a way to consolidate it. At the European Space Agency, we've been developing a process that uses concentrated sunlight to fuse, to sinter, to connect the dust grain together. And it's a 3D printing process, so we can print, 3D print any shape, which means that not only we can do the outer shell of a habitat to protect yourself against radiation, but we have a much more versatile tool. We can also build roads and launch pad. And if we cannot 3D print everything, we also have architects working on how we can make smart blocks that could be piled up so it could be easily, we could easily cover your habitat by, with, a, with a robot or, or astronaut when they arrive at the surface. So that's how you protect your habitat from radiation. But that's not enough, right? Because we want to explore with humans, which means that we need to satisfy human basic needs, drinking water, eating food, Breathing hair, charging your phone. How are you going to do that with just dust at the surface? Let's start by trying to find some oxygen. I told you there is no atmosphere, so you won't find any there. So you have to look at your feet again. You see, the dust of the moon is actually silicates. That's what, you, that's what composes 90% of Earth's crust. It's nothing special about it. It's a material we know very well. And these silicates are actually metals strongly bonded to silicon and oxygen, but actually so much oxygen that it represents over 40% by mass. So for every kilogram of dust you take on the moon, you have actually 400 grams of oxygen in your hand. That's a lot. You just need to find a way to break these bonds. That's what we've been working at the European Space Agency as well. We have developed an electrochemical process where we can put the lunar dust inside and we, we, we can recover all the oxygen of it. So on the left, you have the fake lunar dust we use for research, and on the right, you, have, you see what comes out of the process. So once you remove all the oxygen from this dust, you end up with a shiny metal powder, which is actually as valuable as the oxygen itself, because with this metal powder, we are now able to 3D print spare parts and more complex parts that we could do with the raw material. What about water? So there's a lot of water in space, and usually you find it at cold places. So on planetary bodies, it's usually at the poles. And the moon makes no exception. You have water ice at the, at the north and south pole of the moon. How did this water got there? Well, when you have asteroid or comets carrying water crashing on the moon, water vaporizes and condensates where it's cold, the poles. And over time, it accumulates. And in these craters, it's minus 200 degrees C. So there is no way for the water to escape. This crater never sees sunlight. And today, we from this satellite images, we have very strong evidence that there is water at the poles. Yet, we don't have what we call the ground truth. We don't have a sample of this ice. There have been no mission going to the pole yet. But in the next five years, we have a mission, European mission called Prospect, that will go next to this crater, drill, and sample this ice to analyze its composition so we can start to understand better how we can actually reuse it later. But we need to also understand this distribution. How is it spread around the, the, the poles? And for that, there will be also other mission from uh, international partners. So by the end of the decade, we'll have really a clear understanding of how much ice is actually there and how we can reuse it. Because you see, water in space is a very critical element. It's not just to, for refreshing your astronaut. It's actually fuel. Water is hydrogen and oxygen. If you split, split them by electrolysis, you, have, you can have liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. This is your fuel in space. That's what you will use to go back to Earth. That's what you will use to go further into space. So now that we have water, oxygen, metals, we can start to grow our research station. We can start to build greenhouses to grow our own food. All of that just from the resources of the moon. If we can separate the silicon from the rest of the metal, we, even, we, can, we are even able to make our own solar panels. But during this whole process, you may have noticed something, actually. There is no carbon on the moon. 
there is no hydrocarbon either. So all the processes we do on the moon are actually carbon free. And as you saw, we have developed, we've developed a process to extract oxygen, but actually to extract metals from the soil that is actually carbon free. I think you may know a place that could benefit from such technology. You see, resource extraction represents actually 50% of our carbon footprint on Earth. So because by going to space, we face extreme challenges, we are forced to innovate. And this innovation brings new processes, new technology that have to be first developed on Earth and will first benefit Earth. We expect so much innovation from space exploration that actually that's the third reason we are going to the moon. Because this innovation will not won't only bring the next clean and autonomous processes we need on Earth, but it will go much beyond that. On the moon, or in space in general, we'll develop a complete circular economy because we cannot waste anything. So every waste of a process will be the input for another one in a virtuous circle. And as we get more comfortable, more experience using the resources of space, we can also start to dream bigger. Like, for instance, building solar power station that we could beam free energy, clean energy back to the Earth. So structure are so large that we cannot build by launching rockets over and over on Earth, from Earth. This could be only done once we master the use of the resources of space. And when we get to that stage, actually we'll have astronauts revealing new horizons on Mars. And when they go to Mars, they'll use all the lessons learned at the moon, because there they'll actually see one dot in the skies, which would be the Earth, or actually two dots. One would be the Earth, one would be the moon. Thank you.